thank you for the privilege of sharing your fellowship this week along with my wife. We've certainly enjoyed the time we've spent here. The pastor has been very gracious in everything. Very often when we go to a church, after we've been there a day or two, the pastor begins to unload all his problems on us. Well, this pastor must not have one, because he hasn't said a single thing. Usually they talk about some carnal deacon that upset the apple cart, or uh, some cancer in the church. He hasn't said a thing about that. And if he's going to invite me to be his assistant, he hasn't said a thing about that. So, uh, it's been very good. I appreciate it very deeply. We don't come to the meeting this year that I know of, but so you can pray for us. I do want to do some writing if possible. You notice this 13th chapter of 1st Corinthians has 13 verses. And if I spend as much time on each verse as I've done previously preaching, you should be on for lunch tomorrow, or at least for supper. to this chapter every time you read it is this. It is truly the most beautiful poem on love that has ever been written. And when I read it, it's so smooth, it has no bumps in it, it has no threatenings in it. And I can't help but think as I read it that this is the man who went down the Damascus road reading out threatenings against the church. Being in what was called the talk of his government, that what he thought was the death sentence of the church. He was going to get it destroyed. And now he discovered that this man is just as radical in love as he was in hatred. In the second epistle, he gives us a secret there of his own life. I, I like to know what motivates men. And I don't find anywhere in all his writings that the Apostle Paul. He gives us a summary of his theology, except in the second epistle in the first chapter where he talks about knowing the terror of the Lord we persuade men, and he talks about the judgment seat of Christ, and then he gives a secret, I think, of his life. He says, because the love of Christ constraineth me. And this was his motivation. This man was so hard to believe that the Christians couldn't handle him. Because he says that there was a period when his, his choice friends, the men that were on his gospel team, forsook him. He says, All men forsook me, nevertheless the Lord stood by me. As again, I'm amazed at the, not just the vastness of his theology, I think of the cause of intellect that God used. But I think of the circumference of all his travels. You remember that, that he was born in the ancient capital of the world, which was Tarsus, and he finished in the military capital of the world, which was Rome. In between, he went to the religious capital of the world, which was Jerusalem, and he went to the intellectual capital of the world, which was Athens, and he went to the immortal capital of the world, which was Corinth. This man is tireless. I read the secret of his love, and the best I analyze it is this, that one day, he decided that Jesus Christ was worth everything he had every beat of his heart. He never had any second interest. I read the secret was this, he said, there's one thing I do. And there is no evidence anywhere that this amazing man got swelled or pulled off in any way. He spent his last time or more time in prisons than in palaces. There is no form of persecution that is endured, either physical or mental or spiritual. And he survives all of this. He triumphs in it. Because again, he is motivated by the greatest of all motivations, the love of God, which he speaks of in Romans 7, is shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, this is this book. Obviously, is written, there's first of the sort of the whole is written in answer to a letter. And he gets it there, he says that in the sentence, just so now concerning the things we are not you, what does it mean? And then he goes on in the chapter, is reply to many problems that they had in the church. Now, if you're going to start off the 
My husband was a good, he beat her, he used her like a football. I went to that house, I would have given her 50 cents for everything in it. If he took his shoes off and didn't tie them, he pawned them. I said, you have a clock? No, we have lost. He pawns the clocks. I don't know. He came to church in very poor souls. One day he came in a beautiful ensemble. Oh, she looked gorgeous. Lovely clothes and beautiful dress. She stopped in the foyer of the church and she said to me as she went out, I want to talk to you for a minute. I said, fine. And she opened the comb and she said, do you like my dress? I said, yes. She said, you know, nobody ever wore it before. I said, well, that's nice. And this coat is brand new and my hat and look, my shoes and my handbag. And I said, well, what happened? Did you get some money left? Oh, you know, Mrs. Storms, who comes to church, yes. Well, you know, she's a beautiful Christian. And for many years, she's given me her uh, cast off clothes. She gave me a spring and uh, outfit when she's finished with it. She gave me last year's winter's clothes and so forth. And you know, she came to my house the other day and said, Look, dear, I want to take you to a town and buy you a new outfit. And she said, Oh, that would be wonderful. I haven't got a new outfit since I was married. But really, uh, what, what, you're not just kind of. Uh, you know, being charitable, are you? Uh, you know, she's a little bit of pride. You're not going to do it just because you feel the best. And she said, no. She said, I was praying the other morning, and I, and, and I actually was singing to the Lord, my Jesus, I love thee. And he said, stop. Did he ever say stop to you, or can't he get a word in his place? Does he ever say stop to you when you're praying? And he said, I stop. And he said, look. You cannot love vertically without loving horizontally. You cannot love God or you cannot see without loving your brother who you can see. Now you say that you love me. You said yesterday you were going to buy that beautiful coat and that hat and those matching shoes and that dress and that handbag for, I don't know, say $600. And give your old ones to Mrs. Sorenso again. That is charity. You buy the new ones and you wear the old ones and that's love. Now I went into a shop one day. Well, it wasn't this. I got this one. Again. No, I bought this in the sale. But uh, I went in a shop and the man said to me, there's a suit. That would do for a preacher. I don't know why, but uh, it was cheap. Uh, and uh, so he said, uh, uh, there's a suit. Lay down, and I tried it out. And he said, "You look good in that suit." I said, "I look good in any suit." But anyhow, uh, he said, uh, "Well, I'm going to give it to you." And uh, let me check it. Oh, you need this pants shopping a bit. Now you come on Friday. And I went in. And he said, "Well, there you are. I'm giving you the suit." I said, "No, you're not." He said, "Are you going to buy it?" I said, "No, the price tag is too high." So you're not going to take it, I said, I sure am. He said, how are you going to take it? I said, like this. And I put it on my bag and I started walking out. Well, you said, you wouldn't let me give it to you. No, you haven't given it to me. Well, you haven't bought it? No, I haven't bought it. Well, how do you work it out? I said, immediately I lifted that suit up. There was a record made up there that on a certain day in a certain place, this brother gave a suit to Jesus Christ. How do you figure that out? Because in as much as you do it to the least of my brethren, you do it unto me. What size should you take, Pastor? A 38, remember, please. Uh, <coughs> because in as much as you do it to the pastor, you do it to him, you see. Charity is condescending. Oh, but love is not like that at all. The thing that let this man bear his back to the smiters, hang on a piece of wood in the Mediterranean for 36 hours, in weariness, in fastings, in painfulness, in tribulation, in distress, in famine, in peril, in nakedness, in sword, in perils of the deep, in perils of mine own countrymen, God. And he exhausts everything the devil can shoot at him. And he comes up smiling at the end of it. He says, you know what? They're never going to treat me better than they treated him. And if they treated the Son of God like that, they expect to have this. But I want to tell you something. I've got something inside of me and... Uh, I won't break up under it. Because the love of God again is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. You see, we, we, we are kind of, well, we live in a strange day. A day when people don't know the difference between love and lust. Between laughter and leering. 
We think of love as being a kind of a hothouse plant. It's the very opposite of that. You read that beautiful, beautiful uh, story back in the Old Testament there. And when you get to the end of the Song of Solomon, you know what it says? He says, love is stronger than death. He says, the waters, many waters can and quench love. And then he in the salvation, I'll be paraphrased that like this. He says, waters can and quench it, floods can never drown. Substance can abide, love's a priceless crown. All the wondrous story, mystery divine, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Is there on earth a close of bond than this, that I am my beloved's and I, that, that my beloved's mine and I am his? Fox Jackson, Dr. Fox Jackson of the Methodist, wrote quite a number of years ago, I want, dear Lord, a love that feels for all. A deep, strong love that answers every call. A love divine, a love like thine, a love so high and low. On me, dear Lord, a love like this bestowed. As I mentioned last night, Dr. Tozer said he could lie on his belly on the floor for four or five hours without ever saying a word of prayer or a word of praise because he loved God so much. He would say the language of favor again, Oh, Jesus, Jesus, dearest Lord, forgive me if I say, but very love thy sacred name a thousand times a day. Then he calls it the most that he likes from, uh, from favor. I love thee, Lord. I know not how my raptures to control. Thy love is like a burning fire that burns within my soul. Burn, burn within me, love of God. Burn fiercely night and day till all the cross of earthly love is burned and burned away. One of the salvationists wrote another poem on that. Oh, let me quote here from Charles Redwood. When he said, O oh, thou who came us from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, in the flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart, there it is for thy glory burn, with an extinguishable blaze, and trembling to its source return, in constant prayer, and in praise. And as a little boy I learned to him that Wade Jackson wrote, Love with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know. Still breathing from above, thou hast taught me to so all this full of perfect peace, all this transport, all this love, in a love which cannot see. You can take everything away from a man, you can take his freedom away from him, you can take his past, you can take his children, you can take the whole body, you cannot separate it. Well, that's what, he told his shoulders that with a holy swagger. He said, at the end of Romans, they watch those separators to the love of Christ. Almost thinking of contempt, he said, Watch your separate us from the love of Christ. Shout tribulation, or distress, or famine, or pain, or nakedness, or so on. Things present, things things to come, height, or death, or any other creature, there is nothing. I was thinking to sin in that chapter. Sin will separate us because he grieves the Spirit of God. And then we come back in penitence and humility. But he says, Burn, burn within me, love of God. Salvation, Lord, let me love thee, love is mighty. Swaying realms of deed and thought. By night and walk of Christ, I can serve thee as I ought to be. We all will soften every trial. Love will lighten every care. We are unquestioning, we'll follow. Love will triumph, love will bear. Let me love thee, Savior. And God to give a love will put the church of Jesus Christ back into business. It's the real love of God that's set in our heart, we kept, set upon our heart, we kept the love from God in a year. They were out of the dead love, not a synthetic, theological, homogenized love. Because you see, one of the facts of the world is not as a coin, the other side of the coin is jealousy. Because the word of God says again that my God is a God of love, I the Lord my God, I'm a jealous God. And the pastor was jealous because he hated everything that had to do with anything that would seek to be for the church and everything there. I have a profound admiration for John Wesley. So I said this morning he was converted when he was 35. He was turned 35 to 1 and made 53, and he got them together in 88. So he was converted at 35, about a quarter to nine on the 24th of May, 1738. He died at 88 years of age in full health and strength. The revelation.
most of his life did not take place in the college and the university. Sorry, at the back, we just keep waving that hand. Are you waving to me at the angels? Who you talking to there? Please be quiet. God bless his eyes, but let him look down by a piece of poison. A hundred years before he lived, there was a beautiful little French, petite French lady called Madame Boudinot. And she wrote a hymn, Oh, thou who came as... No, she, she didn't write that. What did you write? Come, Savior Jesus, from above. Accept me with thy heavenly grace. Empty my heart of earthly love, and for thyself prepare a place. You see, I don't say anything dramatic about that. Listen to the next stanza. Nothing on earth do I desire but thy pure love within my breast. This only thing should I require, and freely give up all the rest. Well, God, I'll tell you, and what else this short enduring world can get? Come to ye will, my soul rebel. For Christ alone is our friend. Be with thy love, and be alone with pure delight and inward bliss. To know thou takes me for thine own, all of our happiness is this. Let's go back to that second stanza. Nothing on earth do I desire. Can you tell God that? Can you really? Can you call what God shall bless you for this indeed, O lover of my soul? Thou, O Christ, thou don't I want business, success, and all the other things perish the thought. I want to be a God-filled man. I want that love to consume the boss and let him get whipped to death maybe a half a dozen times. That love that can carry any burden. That love that can sneer for that I want it. And John Wesley to that verse over, Nothing on earth do I desire but thy pure love within my breast. This only this that I require and freely give up all the rest. Well, from a pleasure, and he was a wealthy man. He was a, in a, from a family which was next to the royal family in England. But there came a moment when he surrendered completely, not his sins, but himself. You see, many of us, God has got your sins, but he hasn't got you. He hasn't got your will. He hasn't got your desires. Nothing on earth do I desire. The vice rule of it in my breast is only this will I require and feeding of all the rest well from the place of my else. And John Wesley lived for 53 years after that. He made a fortune with his bed every penny on orphanages for children, printing Bibles, printing hymn books. He got the Atlantic three times a little when he was saved. He lay down in Georgia one night, he had long hair, and when he woke up in the morning, his body was frozen to the ground, and he said, I, I managed to get one arm out, and when I got it out, I pulled the other out, and then he said, I got my hair and pulled it out of the mouth, and then he said, I worked on one left and then the other, and I stood up with the clay, the frozen to my, my, my clothes, and then I brushed off the four frost like snow, and I raised up my hands and sang the doxology, clay God from whom all blessings flow. And he didn't go to Florida for six months rest after that, and I took a look out of it. He took it all in his stride. The love of God was praised of him, and the heart dying there because he wanted to be a missionary, and he wasn't saved yet. There was a constraining love in him. He took a big one, done in light, done educated, done the earth, done wanted, done so, done my people. And so from 35, for 53 years, he spent his life in tireless energy for men and women. And when he died, he wasn't God, he not be left when he died. He could have died this, and if he had given his genius to this, he would have died on both sides of the air. If he had given his genius to inventions, because he used to invent everything for, for, for the sake of a hobby, he might have had everything that is in. If he had stayed in the church of England, he would have been the most brilliant Archbishop of Canterbury England ever had. But you see, he laid in dust like very dead. Like George Matheson, when he lost his eyesight and his girlfriend threw him over. She didn't want him married and handicapped to a blind preacher, and he wrote a beautiful man out of pain. Where most blessings come from. He wrote a love with him, oh love, but will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I know, that in thine ocean depths its fall may rich and full of thee. Hail, oh, joy that seekest me to pain. I never ask this life fruit from thee. I thirst the rain go through the rain, and feel thy promise is not vain. That morn shall tear us be. 
Many say he goes on and he finishes it by saying, I'm laying down my glory that I might pass. If I could leave, I'd leave six feet in the air, but I can't do it. I exclude in the thing that the man may try to determine the problem soon. But in the darkest hour of his life, when the dirt lies and the leaning of him to be crippled as he were, the handicap, he said, I lay in dust, life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms where life such an end will be. No, this man doesn't pursue the career of a diplomat. He doesn't say I stay in the cosy church of England to become his most distinguished prime minister. He doesn't stand up as uh, 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 his most distinguished bishop. He doesn't stand going to politics and become the most distinguished prime minister of England. He doesn't stand going to be a merchant to take money. It's all right. I'm not requiring money. I'm saying this for something greater. And money's all right. It doesn't master you. If you can master it greatly, it must be who you're in trouble. So John Wesley dies. He left in his will that they should take his body to the grave, of course. But he should be carried there by six porters. And he said, give each of them one pound note. And that's all he left in cash. He left a pound note for each man that was sitting into his grave. He left six pound notes. He left six silver spoons. As a matter of fact, the IRS in that day was after him because he six silver spoons. Where did you get them? You see, you thought IRS was a modern disease. Well, it's not. It's 200 odd years old anyhow because they were after Wesley in his day. What are you doing with six silver spoons? So he had six pound notes, still six silver spoons, a handful of books, a faded Geneva gown that he fixed in, and was there something else in that? What was it? Oh, I know the Methodist church. I knew there was something. It wasn't served up to him on a platter. You know, the last 600 sermons that Mr. Wesley preached, he preached in the streets. He only got into church six times to preach out of 600 sermons. A friend of mine has a beautiful lithograph, an old, old picture I would like very much. And he shows a man with a, with a butcher's cleaver standing before Wesley going to spit his head. It shows a man with a pitchfork behind him. It shows a, a man in a tree with a thunder blasting. And he wanted to hear him. He had to stand on his father's tomb to preach. You know, the worst thing that happens to the church of God is when he becomes rich. I said to you the other day that I like that definition by Dr. J.B. Phillips, because he's English anyhow. But J.B. Phillips has a summary of the Acts of the Apostles, which is superb. He sees the whole of the Acts of the Apostles flapping with eyes. Why? Because the love of God was shed abroad in their hearts. J.B. Phillips sums up the early church in the Acts of the Apostles like this. He says, this is the church of Jesus Christ. Before it became struck, and before it became fat and short of breath by prosperity. This is the church of Jesus Christ before it became muscle bound by over-organization. This is, another, this is the church of Jesus Christ where they didn't gather together a, a, a bunch of intellectuals to study psychosomatic medicine. They healed the sick. Uh, this is the Church of Jesus Christ where they did not say prayers, but they prayed in the Holy Ghost. No wonder they're an embarrassment to government. No wonder they turned the world upside down. They didn't live in the lush, smooth, comfortable atmosphere we're in. You've been a wonderful audience, and I thank you for coming night after night. Hear my gentle words. And uh, I'm glad you came. But I was in a meeting not too long ago where the preacher told me, he said, the other week we had a veteran missionary here. Man, the old guy was treated like this, an old Pentecostal preacher that had weathered many a storm in Africa. And he said he'd just been in a church, he told me. It was a cold winter night. We had a pretty cold winter last winter. These both places had. And the pastor stood up and said, my dear friends, this Wednesday night, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming to church. It is a terrible night. The wind is blowing and it's most uncomfortable. And you've come to church. Oh, you're so wonderful. He was prepared to rapture them and give them all a crown right on the, right on the spot. They were so marvelous that they come to church. And he said, I want to thank you from the depths of my... Oh, he laid it on, and the old boy there was <coughs> like this all the time. 
when he got up, he said, I'm glad to be here tonight. And I would like to add my personal gratitude that you people left your central heated homes and got in your beautiful uh, heated cars and came to this heated church to sit on these nice soft pews Whereas when I am in Africa, a man will walk 15 miles to church and often have to stop to get thorns out of his feet and often hazard his life because there are lions there and often has danger crossing a river because of that hippo uh, 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 hippopotamuses, hippopotamuses, oh God, anyhow, you know what they are, those ugly things. And then on top of that, crocodiles. And he said, you know what, they walk 15 miles home at night and they haven't got a bite of food when they get there. And you lush people, let your warm homes for your warm cars for a warm church and beautiful seats. He said, I'm going to preach, but I'll have to go and throw up first. You'll make me sick. Well, maybe that's a bit of it. No, it's not exaggeration, that actually happens. You see, the softer you get, the softer you get. Oh, aren't we wonderful? I sometimes wonder what will happen when persecution really does come. How many of us will stand the test? And we got what it takes. You can't love theology. You can't love a creed. You can only love a living person who is Jesus Christ. And Wesley fell in love. Everything was consumed in him. Nothing on earth do I desire. And nothing ever charmed him after that. All the seductions of the world were lost on him. No, sir, he didn't leave too much. They said, of course, a lot of blessed memories for all of us. Again, I say, love is not a hothouse plant. Waters cannot quench it, floods can never drown. Substance cannot buy it, love's a priceless crown. You see, this was the emphasis of Jesus. I can imagine a man coming to him one day and saying, uh, I think you're quite a preacher. I really do. I sat on the edge of the crowd and heard the most amazing thing that would ever be said. I think they call it the Sermon on the Mount. It was fabulous. And uh, I think he did a good job. But you know, I, I have a problem. I've got a brother, and, and he, 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 well, he's a form in my flesh. I just can't manage him. He gets me angry, and I bail him out of trouble twice. And he's come back a third time. Do I have to bail him out a third time? And Jesus says, no. He said, well, thank you, sir. What do I do? He says, bail him out 70 times, sir. Oh. So he went home, and he bought a sheet of plywood, 8 feet by 4, and he made 490 squares on it. And he nailed it up in the kitchen, and every time his brother did something wrong, he ticked it off, he ticked it off. And one day, uh, about three years after his brother did something bad, and he went to him, he said, Listen, I want to tell you something. I've been putting up with this for nearly three years. And that preacher fellow said, I have to forgive you 490 times, you've got the 485, and I'm going to tell you something. When do we get to 490, you've got it all coming. Well, that's a legalistic way of looking at it, isn't it? I mean, I'm only to forgive him 490 times. There's nearly got that. No, no, no. Jesus says love doesn't count at all. It doesn't count at all. I may speak of the tongues of men and of angels, but if I have no love, it doesn't say if I have no love, tongues are nothing, or gifts are nothing. It says if I have no love, I'm a model nobody. You can raise the dead. One of the most amazing things Jesus ever said, as far as I'm concerned, was this. That some of you will come up to the judgment seat and say, Hi, I'm a great preacher. I cast out devils. I did this. He said, I never knew you. Oh, we're not going to be judged for the size of our works. We're going to be judged for the quality, not the quantity. And the Apostle Paul, at least here again, is trying to get through to these people. Remind them of the greatness of this fact that they can be filled with the love of God. It can be shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now he says, well, I speak in the tongues of men. The preacher robbed me of a point there, but I still love him. Uh, in the sleepy Elizabethan English version here, it says, charity suffers long. Now I told you the difference between charity and love. The woman gives away her old clothes in charity. She wears the old ones and buys the other lady new ones. That's love that does that. 
And then so you read this wonderful, wonderful chapter, love suffers long in this kind, love envies not, love bonds of not itself, love is never rude, not its translation. Love is never rude, love is, love is never irritated, love is never glad when others go wrong, love is always slow to expose, love is always eager to believe the best. It beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, it endureth all things. Now that's a strange word, love, isn't it? And that's what it is in English, we've only one word for love. People say, I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my husband. Same love that they have for the cat. Love my husband, love the cat, love football, love this, love this. You've only got one word. The Greeks have at least four. But he isn't talking of something that in classical Greek here, he's talking about a different love that comes from heaven. It's exactly the same word which is used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that beareth all things. Do I have to bear with my brother 490 times? No, you have to bear with him 490 times more after that and after that and after that and after that. This love beareth all things, and it believeth all things, and it hopeth all things, and it endureth all things. In fact, he goes to the maximum and he says, you know what, this love never faileth. Now you can think of this chapter if you like, one thing in 13, I think of it this way, it's like a ring, a gold ring. And there are three precious jewels of it. And the three precious jewels are faith and hope and love, these three. Two of them you won't take in, uh, to, well, two of them, yes, they're all abiding, they're all abiding. The others don't abide, there's no sins in them, there's no miracles in them, you won't need faith in them. But he said, those things are going to pass, read the chapter. He talks about things which are passing and things which are permanent. Miracles, there's no good of healing in heaven. Preaching, what a relief, there'll be no preaching in heaven. Offerings, there'll be no offerings in heaven. There are a lot of things heaven won't have. I'm going to leave them behind, but there are three things I take out of time into eternity. Now abide of faith and hope and love. The three jewels on the ring, but the greatest of the three is the central one, which is love. After all, who is the first being in the world? God. And God is love. What is the first and greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength and thy neighbor as thyself. What is the first fruit of the Spirit? The first being in the world is God. The first and greatest commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The first fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. I've been to Ireland. Once when we were living in England, I went to Ireland and when I was there, somebody told me an old preacher had some telescopes to say, and our boys were interested in a telescope. So I went along and I, I talked to this old man and he said, well, I'll sell you this one. It's a brass barrel telescope with four or five extensions for $15. I bought it. <coughs> I brought it home. We lived on a hill overlooking Manchester. He had a bay window with a four-story house I could. And I said to the boys, now you can sit in the window of our bedroom and you can search all over Manchester. I thought, I have solved the greatest problem ever. I've got three boys, they're going to be quiet for the next three years, looking through a telescope. And they were quiet for three minutes. They, uh, Paul came downstairs and he said, Daddy, it is a good telescope. I said, thank you. I wanted to buy a good telescope, but he said, uh, it's a celestial telescope. I said, what do you mean? Well, it's going to be so useful for looking at stars. That means you can see it every night. Look at the stars. I made a problem instead of stars in work. They never want to go to bed. They want to sit there looking at stars. I said, this is my telescope. And the little guy got by it and then he said, look, 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 look. And he pulled out the extension and he said, look, look. I saw that barrel of being love. The extension is joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, so forth and so forth. They were all there in the battle of love. You exercise them in love. It gives some time to listen, sir. So you find a lot of things that you can't come here. I preach in Pentecost and Jesus often, and I'll take them in there. How is it going to say the medical on fire? How is it going to make some miracles on the body? The strength is not in bones, the strength is not in miracles, the 